Here we go, diving headfirst into the drama, with Judge Lake cracking open the legendary saga of Miller vs. Rasmussen. Ms. Miller steps into the ring, armed with conviction, aiming to drop the bomb on her ex-lover, Mr. Rasmussen, that he's not the daddy of her adorable three-year-old munchkin, Zaley. Mr. Rasmussen, on the flip side, is all in, betting his bottom dollar that he's Zaley's real dad, throwing shade at Ms. Miller's denials. Buckle up, because what comes next is a wild ride. Ms. Miller, you're here to prove to your ex-boyfriend, Scotty Rasmussen, that he is not the father of your three-year-old daughter, Zaley Rath. Yes, Your Honor. You claim you've been in an ongoing court battle over custody and have petitioned the court several times for a DNA test, all of which have been denied. Yes, Your Honor. Grab your tissues. This part's a tearjerker, Mr. Rasmussen's epic journey. Picture this, Mr. Rasmussen, our dedicated hero, hitting the road, clocking a whopping 160 miles every fortnight just to catch a glimpse of Zaley, showcasing a level of commitment and wallet drain that deserves its own Netflix special, despite Ms. Miller's ice-cold shoulder. Brace yourself, because the plot is about to do a 360. Uh, I drive 100 and about 60 miles every other weekend just to pick up my daughter and drop her off. Over the, that's about 10,000 miles. That's wear and tear on my car. She doesn't have a driver's license. She doesn't have any any way to bring her to me. She doesn't have any way to meet me halfway. You say she hates? She, yeah, she why hates. Would, why does she hate? She hates me because at the end of the relationship when things got rocky, I'll admit it, I did go to another woman. I'll be the first to admit that, you know, it was my mistake. And then, the plot gets juicier. Ms. Miller's twists and turns. Here's where Ms. Miller throws in a curveball, voicing her skepticism about Mr. Rasmussen's paternity claims. She spills the tea that when Zaley was being knitted in the womb, Mr. Rasmussen was off gallivanting in another state and she was playing house with another chap. Strap in, folks. We're going deeper down the rabbit hole. When she was conceived, she was conceived in March of 2011, he wasn't even in the same state. He was in Vegas. And at that time in March, I wasn't even with him. I was with some Somebody else because he broke up with me because he cheated on me. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it was a, it was a mistake. Okay, we've gotten the fact that you two have an on and off relationship that has infidelity woven through. This moment will have your heart doing backflips, Mr. Rasmussen's undying vow. In a tale as old as time, Mr. Rasmussen gives us the lowdown on his unwavering dedication to Zalia, narrating his sprint to Ms. Miller's side during the drama of childbirth, painting himself as the ultimate knight in shining armor, dead set on donning the daddy mantle. And then, boom, a plot twist that flips the script. Born, so she already had your name. She already had my Did name. Did you sign the birth certificate? That is correct. Your I name's just, on the birth certificate. I have Corona, that right, you hand me that, please? I have that right here. My name is, I was at the birth, I was at every single doctor doctor's appointment. When Zaley was born, you were at a doctor's appointment. I was at home because I had to work that day. I was, at my I was at my job as a cashier. Hold on to your hats for this bombshell. The great feature showdown. Mr. Rasmussen steps up, armed with childhood snaps of himself, laying them side by side with Zaley's in a bid to draw lines of resemblance that would make a detective proud, all while Ms. Miller shakes her head in disbelief. The next revelation is a real mind bender. The more I started noticing more of her features, the more she started looking like the other guy. She that. looks exactly like I did when I was three years old. I have a picture of me when I was three and a picture of her from just the other Let day. Let me see that. Will you hand that to me, Jerome? Believe it or not, when I was three years old, I had blonde hair. And so this is a picture of Zaley on the left and you as a child, Mr. Rasmussen, on the right. You'll never see it coming. The jaw-dropping verdict and emotional roller coaster. The DNA test results are in and they drop like a bomb. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Rasmussen, you are not a <laughs> Miss Miller. Be respectful. I'm sorry. Miss Miller. I'm sorry. That's a lot of nerve considering the alternative is somebody that don't want nothing to do with you or your child. I'm sorry. That's a lot of nerve. You just show me where your priorities were right there. Because I held out hope that you weren't just acting a fool because you so mad at him. Can you believe the absolute circus that's unfolding right in front of our eyes? Mr. Hodges, decked out in a suit that screams, I'm here to win, alongside his mother, who's armed with enough skepticism to power a small town, swings open their case like it's showtime. They're putting all their chips on the table, doubting the paternity of the pint-sized, one-month-old sensation, Lillian Willard, branding Ms. Willard the queen of deceit and tomfoolery. They're here to prove without a a shadow of a doubt that Mr. Hodges isn't the father. On the flip side, Ms. Willard, backed by her own mother, who's just as fiery, stands her ground with a conviction that's over 9,000, claiming that Mr. Hodges is unquestionably Lillian's dad. And just when you think this couldn't turn into more of a soap opera... Mr. Hodges, you and your mom opened your case today because you both say the defendant is a liar and a cheater. You don't believe you fathered her one-month-old daughter, Lillian Willard, and plan to prove that today. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. 
Ms. Willard, you two are here with your mother, and the two of you testify that you are 1,000% sure Mr. Hodges fathered your daughter. Is that correct? Out of left field comes a curveball nobody saw coming. Amidst a backdrop of gasps and popcorn munching, Mr. Hodges throws down the gauntlet, accusing Ms. Willard of playing the field, with a spicy anecdote about stumbling upon a mystery man tucked away in her room. Despite her pinky promises of staying true and transparent, he's convinced she's been playing him for a fool. Ms. Willard, in her defense, spins a tale of innocence, claiming the guy was merely a blast from the pace, a childhood buddy making a cameo, hidden from Mr. Hodges, to sidestep unnecessary drama. The plot thickens to the consistency of old school oatmeal and you won't believe the twist coming up next cheated on me and i caught her with multiple guys she had one hidden in the room and whenever we first got together she said that she would never hurt me or cheat on me she would be truthful and yet she's lied to me left and right miss willard you kept lying and you kept cheating no i did not i had a guy over at my house yes he was visiting because he was a childhood friend and i didn't tell him because i knew he'd flip out because i know how he is in a plot twist that would make novelists jealous, the courtroom becomes the stage for the bombshell that Ms. Willard was playing house with Mr. Hodges, while still legally hitched to another dude. A juicy piece of trivia that Mr. Hodges was blissfully unaware of. The collective jaw drop could be felt in the next county, throwing a wrench into the narrative of their whirlwind engagement and the tangled web of their relationship history. The maternal units dive into the fray, their involvement cranking up the drama and emotional stakes to soap opera heights. Grab your snacks and hold on tight, because what's about to unfold will leave you picking your jaw up off the floor. You found him hiding in the house? Yes, Your Honor. Hiding in the house where? In her mother's bedroom. Back, but did you help hide the other guy in your bedroom I when did. Mr. Hodges came? They had broke up. So why do you have to hide anybody? Because she Pardon? didn't want him to know. She didn't want to hurt him. She didn't want to start no trouble because Hardy's got a temper. Well, we was engaged. It was my understanding they had broke up. So were you engaged or were you broken up? We was engaged. We, we were engaged. Things are getting hotter than a summer barbecue. Ms. Blevins, aka Mama Hodges, in a move that could rival any detective drama, whips out text message receipts of Ms. Willard's rendezvous and fabrications, casting even more doubt on the paternity saga of Lillian. These messages, spicier than a ghost pepper, show Ms. Willard in 4K discussing Lillian's debut into the world and who the daddy might be, with another contender suggesting a plot twist that Mr. Hodges might not be the only chef in the kitchen. This bombshell sends suspicions about Lillian's paternity and Ms. Willard's trustworthiness into the stratosphere. But brace yourselves, because there's more drama on the horizon that's going to turn everything upside down. Mm. And you write back, looks that way. Yes, ma'am. So, Ms. Willard, were you dating this man and Mr. Hodges at the same time? No, Your Honor. Your Honor. So why is this man saying this? He's given all these specific details to Ms. Blevins. He was at the hospital when Lillian was... Yes, I was with him at that time. Your Honor, he's saying that. He's saying that because he wants my daughter. I've been through it with this person when... I think it's in February, right after Christmas sometime, when she, she didn't even know she was pregnant at that time. The roller coaster of revelations doesn't seem to end. In a courtroom that's now morphed into a stage for Shakespearean twists, Ms. Willard comes clean, admitting to sending Mr. Hodges on a wild goose chase with creative storytelling about Lillian's grand entrance to prevent the crumbling of his marriage fortress. Her confession paints a complex picture of her motives, weaving through her longing for a family unit and her telenovela-esque liaisons with other characters during her pregnancy saga. The courtroom, now doubling as a theater audience, is left scratching their heads, trying to detangle this Gordian knot of fibs to chart a course for Lillian's future. Ms. Willard, this is too much lying. I know. This is this is just too much lying. Now, I heard about five lies already. What is going on? Why are you texting him like the baby isn't born when the baby is born? He's married now, and I just didn't want to break up a marriage when he found out he had a kid by another person. That's, that's it. Just when you're convinced the writers have run out of ideas, the moment of truth arrives with the grand unveiling of the DNA test results. Like I'm being jumped on, mm -hmm. basically. Everyone's against me. Do you also feel like you know you're responsible for a lot of what's happening here? Yes, and I take credit for that. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Hodges, you are the father. In an utterly jaw-dropping turn of events that no one saw coming, not even the psychic down the street, Ms. Beckley steps up with the confidence of a stand-up comedian on open mic night, claiming Mr. Allen is the bona fide, undeniable biological father of her one-year-old daughter, Ida Leigh Beckley. She's not just asking, she's demanding he step up to the plate. Meanwhile, Mr. Allen is in the corner, shaking his head in disbelief, utterly convinced his only child is his pet goldfish. The drama is so thick you could cut it with a knife, and folks, this emotional rodeo is just getting started. Ms. Beckley, you are 
are in court today to prove Mr. Allen is the biological father of your one-year-old daughter, Italy Beck. Yes, Your Honor. You say Mr. Allen has only seen his daughter one time since she has been born, and you want him to take responsibility starting today. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. After a start so electrifying it could power a small village, an emotional Ms. Beckley with the flair of a seasoned soap opera star pours her heart out about Mr. Allen's ghosting act on their daughter, Itale. It's like he's there for their other kiddos, but for Itale, ghosted. This bombshell not only cranks up the personal stakes sky high, but slaps a big, fat question mark on Mr. Allen's responsibility card. This emotional hurricane is picking up speed, and we're all in for a wild ride. To take responsibility of something we both made, it makes me feel angry. I'm angry. She, she's without a father, you know, and, and it's just, it's terrible that she has to go through that, and I'm raising her on my own. I just feel like you should be a dad to her, because you are her father. And you feel like he's just neglecting your child. Yes, ma'am. He's neglecting her with the other two kids we have. As the tension builds up, we're taken on a trip down memory lane to a steamy encounter between Ms. Beckley and Mr. Allen, post a spicy but brief breakup. Mr. Allen, with the conviction of a man who just remembered he left the stove on, admits to the encounter, but insists the paternity timeline is as suspicious as a cat lurking around an open can of tuna. The layers of complexity here could rival an onion, folks. And trust me, it's making everyone cry. Strap in, because this tale is about to twist and turn faster than a roller coaster with a vendetta. We were co-parents and we were still good friends. That's not um, true. On Germany's second birthday, he wasn't staying with me, but he ended up coming back on her birthday. We had sex, unprotected. It wasn't baby making sex. It was angry it's, sex. It's not about baby making sex. Sex is it sex. Was, it was angry sex. Sex is sex. It, it was baby out of, it making, was out love making, hate making. It, it don't matter what type of sex it was, it was unprotected. It was angry sex. I was mad at the fact that she put me at the house, that I had been there taking care of her and the children. Just when you're convinced it couldn't get more bonkers, boom, evidence surfaces, showing Mr. Allen playing favorite with his kids faster than a reality TV star. Flipping houses. He's all in for some, but for Aitale, invisible. The drama meter is off the charts as we navigate through the maze of legal and emotional turmoil over formal daddy acknowledgments. And just when your jaw hits the floor, we're about to drop even more bombshells. I was at the hospital by myself. He was not there. I have evidence, Your Honor. I'd like to see it. He signed um, Germany's and Xavier's birth certificate. Hers is not signed. So the first one is for Germany, Jacqueline, and Allen. Father's name's there. Second one, Xavier, Dantes, Tyrell, Jerome, Allen. Father's name is there. Throwing a curveball into this epic saga, Mr. Allen steps into the spotlight, trying to paint a picture of himself as the victim, sidelined in Itale's life by an invisible force field allegedly put up by Ms. Beckley. It's a tale of missed birthdays and whispered lullabies, folks. But is he the hero of his story or the villain? Grab your popcorn, because this tale of tangled co-parenting webs is about to add another layer of intrigue. The other kids, Mr. Allen, but not in time with or bond with Italy. Well, Your Honor, I have a question, Shamia, about Italy. You know. I ask her, I speak to her. She say no. You know, I ask when she come, well, while us having a visitation every other week, I pick, the, we have swap and exchange at a police station. We don't bring Italy. Make Italy a factor to my life. She gave You're her, denying she her. Gave why, her, would her I, why would I bring she her gave, to see you? Just when you thought the air couldn't get any thicker with tension, enter stage left, Mr. Allen's fiance, Cheyenne Montgomery, bringing with her a whirlwind of rumors and a dash of sass, suggesting there's more to Mr. Allen's paternity doubts than meets the eye. Her tales of Ms. Beckley's so called escapades add spice to the stew, turning this dispute into a full-blown telenovela. The stakes are at sky-high levels, folks, as we gear up for a climax you won't forget. Before she say anything, Your Honor, she has nothing to do with it. Whatever she says, it's false and it's irrelevant. She don't All know right. me, I don't know her. Okay, let me be the judge of that since I'm the judge. I'm Darius' fiance, Your Honor. She has told Darius that he was not the father. It's been said that she's told another guy he was the father. Okay, y'all got proof of that and y'all fiancés are with a ring at. Girl, mind your business. With a ring at, right. You have no business, that's why you you're here you're because you're worried about, was you in a band for me and we had her? With everyone on the edge of their seats, the atmosphere buzzing with anticipation. The grand unveiling of the DNA test results. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Allen, you are the father. Told you. Stepmama. Stepmama. Stop, stop. Your Honor. We kick things off with Miss Jackson storming onto the scene, guns blazing, vowing to uncover the truth behind the scandalous claim that her husband's mistress's newborn, little Kaasia, shares his DNA. She's adamant that if this baby drama turns out to be reality, she's slamming the door on her marriage for good. Buckle up because you're in for a wild ride. Miss Jackson, you say you're here? Insisting her baby girl is the spitting image of Miss Jackson's hubby. She throws down the gauntlet, daring Miss Jackson to face the music. Brace yourselves because the drama is about to skyrocket. Tell me, how did you find out your 
husband may be having a child with well, his mistress. Yana, I got an epiphany. Call it woman's intuition, whatever you want. Well, I went to my husband's job. It was about 9.30 or 10.30 at night. Talked for a few minutes. And to end our conversation, I told him, things just got real. The stage is set for an epic showdown as Miss Jackson dishes the dirt on how she caught wind of her husband's side escapades. The bombshell drops when she encounters Miss Lipscomb, who casually drops the, oh, by the way, I'm the other woman and I'm pregnant line. Your jaw is going to drop. Get your popcorn ready. The courtroom drama hits fever pitch as Mr. Jackson saunters in, oozing regret, or is that just sweat? The spotlight's on him, and it's his moment to either shine or sink as he faces the music. Trust me, the pot is just starting to simmer. Hey, watch your step going up the steps. Plot twist of the century. Just when you thought it couldn't get any more convoluted, Miss Jackson drops the bomb that she's also expecting Mr. Jackson's bundle of joy. The plot thickens into a veritable stew of dilemmas, leaving us wondering about the fate of their rocky romance. Strap in, because the roller coaster is about to go. At which time that child become my dependent as well on my benefit. They have not paid for anything for my child. The grand finale we've all been on the edge of our seats for. In a twist that nobody saw coming, the paternity test results are in. Just when you thought daytime TV couldn't get any wilder, we kick off with Miss Aiken, dropping the legal bomb of the century on her mom for a paternity mix-up. She's out here claiming the guy on her birth cert is as much her dad as a random dude from a 90s boy band, stirring up a whole kettle of confusion and feelings of betrayal. And you thought your family reunions were awkward. Miss Aiken, you filed a lawsuit against your mother for paternity fraud. You claim due to her many lies, you uncovered that one man is on your birth certificate, but you grew up calling another man dad. You are confused and say your world has been turned upside down, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Cue the dramatic courtroom music. Miss Aiken's mom stands firm, shaking off the accusation like a soap opera queen, swearing she's as innocent as a kitten and betting all her cookies that the DNA results will have her back. She's already drafting her I told you so speech, folks. The DNA results prove who you claim is your daughter's biological father. You want an apology, is yes, that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Miss Aiken, explain to me how your mother committed fraud. For years, my mom has been lying to me back and forth about who is my daddy is, and I'm hurt and I'm tired and I need to know who is my daddy. Plot twist incoming. Brittany Aiken gets a curveball thrown her way when Harry Jenkins Jr., in a scene straight out of a telenovela, reveals he got the you are not the father spiel from her mom, kicking off a wild goose chase for the real paternal MVP. Grab your popcorn. Harry Jenkins Jr. told me that my mom told him I wasn't his daughter, but he was like, whatever Wait a minute, is. wait a minute. Another in my life told that. So, do you believe Ms. Aiken is Mr. Jenkins' biological child? Yes, Your Honor. That is what you're asserting here in court today. Yes, Yes, Your Honor. Throughout your childhood, you were told that Mr. Jenkins was your biological father? Yes, Your Honor. As if we're not already knee-deep in this soap opera, Brittany discovers her birth certificate plays a game of musical dads, listing Thomas Lewis Aiken as the Papa Bear. This revelation sends her on a detective spree, uncovering family secrets like she's on a treasure hunt. But instead of gold, it's just more confusion about who she should be sending Father's Day cards to. Yes, Jerome, Your Honor. will you pass me her evidence, please? Why did and you go get a birth certificate? To get his survivor's check, Your Honor. Okay, so upon Mr. Jenkins' uh, death, you were trying to collect benefits. Yes. And when you got your your birth certificate, what did you find? That Thomas Lewis Aiken name was on my birth certificate, not Mr. Jenkins. When you see the name Thomas Lewis Aiken, what do you do? I'm puzzled because I don't know this man. In a twist that not even Maury saw coming, Brittany meets Thomas Aiken's mom, and they're practically mirror images of each other. She's out here solving family puzzles, wondering if she's also inherited the family's uncanny ability to parallel park on the first try. Ever get a chance to meet Mr. Aiken? No, Your Honor, because he wasn't there yet. After we had went over and left. She told me and my husband, Thomas Aiken, had filled out the birth certificate. When she was laying in the bed, she had dozed off and went to sleep. Oh! Your mother says that when she was asleep, Mr. Aiken filled out the birth certificate and put his name on it. Yeah, I did not tell her that. You can't make this stuff up, folks. Thomas Aiken throws another wrench in the works, swearing he couldn't be Britney's dad because he was busy enjoying a government-sponsored vacation, AKA he was in jail during her conception. The plot thickens like my grandma's gravy. Uh -huh. Side of two. Mr. Aiken, thank you for joining us. You may be seated. Mr. Aiken, as you know, we are here discussing um, eternity surrounding Brittany. She carries your last name. Uh, do you acknowledge that you have had a relationship with Ms. Bonnie Aiken? Yeah, that's my wife. You are still married yeah, to her. Still married to her. To this day. To this day. 
and just when you think we're heading for a commercial break, Brittany attempts to play DNA detective with Thomas Aiken, aiming to swab and solve the mystery once and for all. But alas, fate has other plans, and the DNA test fades into the sunset, leaving our heroine with more questions than a philosophy major. So Go. in your mind, there is no way that you are her biological father. So, Brittany, did you ever hear this? Because you believe he could be your biological father, but saying now today there's no way I could be. When, when I met Thomas, I had gave him the birth certificate. Mm. I didn't feel that out. It wasn't me. Your mom told me, you're not my child. That's right. Yeah. Hold on to your hats, because here comes the mother of all twists. The DNA results are in. It's been determined by this court. Mr. Jenkins and Miss Brittany Aiken are not related. <gasps> I'm sorry, I'm all, so but I always had thought that was your daddy. Buckle up, folks. We're diving headfirst into the Who's Your Daddy? Olympic Games. The case kicks off with all the usual courtroom pomp and ceremony, setting up a paternity pickle between Ms. Adams and Mr. Spencer over some adorable 13-month-old twins. Get your popcorn ready, because this drama train is leaving the station. Choo-choo. Ms. Adams, you say you were caught in a love triangle, and now the defendant doesn't believe he fathered your 13-month-old twins, Kamarion and Kamariana. You testify that you are 100% certain he is is and plan to prove it today in court. Picture this, Ms. Adams caught in a love pretzel. Not just a triangle, folks. She details her leap from a long-term love ship into Mr. Spencer's arms, or, well, the general vicinity. It's like a romantic comedy without the budget for a big-name cast. Strap in, the soap opera twists are just getting started. Well, to be honest with you, I got caught up in a love triangle because um, I was with the same man for 13 years. I had separated. When we separated, I had one now actually one day, you know, to the bar, and that's when I had met Marquis. That's when uh, we start, you know, having dealings with each other and things like that. You were in a long-standing relationship. Yes. Um, and then you broke up. And during that time, you were intimate with Mr. Spencer. Yes. Did you use protection? No. Over to Mr. Spencer, who's pretty sure he's not the father, but also kind of is. It's like choosing between deal or no deal without seeing the cases. He's planning a grand exit if the DNA results say, not it. Next up, will Mr. Spencer ghost or get ghosted? Stay tuned. You all have started having a sexual relationship. You didn't use protection. Yes, yeah, sir. But yeah, you sure. weren't in a committed relationship. No, we were Miss Adams, were you intimate with anybody else during that time? No, I was not. So how soon after you broke up with your ex did you meet Mr. Spencer? I'll say like about two and a half months later. So during this window of time you were intimate with Mr. Spencer, you were not dealing with your ex at all? No, I was not. Boom. Ms. Adams drops the pregnancy bomb while Mr. Spencer's MIA, making it a solo celebration. She's certain he's the papa bear to her cubs, even when he's off the grid. Will he buy balloons or both? The suspense is real, folks. Well, I had found it out pregnant uh, during the time that uh, Markeith Spencer had went away. Uh, when Markeith went away, I had found out the same week that I was pregnant. All right, the point you found out you were pregnant, who did you tell? I told um, a family member of of Markeith Spencer that I was currently pregnant and that I need to speak with him immediately. And you were confident at that time that Mr. Spencer was your child's biological father. And so, Mr. Spencer, your family member formed you that Ms. Adams was pregnant? Yeah, she called me. Enter stage left, the ex and his mom casting doubts like they're fishing for doubts in the sea of paternity. Suddenly, everyone's a family resemblance expert. Get ready for a plot twist that makes M. Night Shyamalan look predictable. How do we get here? Once I had the babies, the pictures went out on, on the internet, and that's when my ex-mother called me and said that those are my grandbabies. They look just like my son. Oh. And so once she said that, had you been thinking of that in the back of your mind all Never. this time? Never. Never. It, I was starting to hear it so much and I was getting so many phone calls from like my ex side of the family and everything about the boy. Marion, they were saying he looked like my ex. Plot twist. Ms. Adams admits to using the twins as adorable, albeit confusing, bait to reel her ex back in. It's like the parent trap, but with less Lindsay Lohan and more Maury Povich. But wait, there's more more. Will our star-crossed lovers reunite, or is this the end of their rom-com? Marquis was not the father, but then, you know, she was just telling me, oh, Christian, put two or two together, just think about it. You know, like, it, it don't make sense. You already had the babies early, so you could have been already pregnant when you was messing with Mr. Spencer. You know, she was just, you know, saying things like that and stuff, so then I started saying, well, you know what, you never know, and I was also just going off of emotion and knowing I was still in love and things like that, so I just wasn't really even looking at the whole situation. I just was like, whatever it was it took to get back with him. Just when you thought our love triangle couldn't get any more obtuse, Ms. Adams decides Mr. Spencer is out of the love game. It's
It's like a reality TV elimination round, but the stakes are two cute twins. Who will get the final rose? Or, you know, the diaper bag? Where are you in the story? You're telling both men now at this point is their twin? After I had the babies, Markeva was around for the first month. D throughout that whole month, it was like so much drama with his ex, so much drama with him. It was like all over again from Mitchell. Yes. Because his mom called him. So he called me and was like, Christian, I'm hearing that it's a chance that those babies are mine. Is that true? I said that I knew that they was Marquis Evans. I said, but to this point, you just never know. Just come back because I want you to come back regardless. We could just start over. The drama peaks as everyone confronts everyone else. It's like a family reunion, but with more accusations and less potato salad. This is the moment when secrets come out and everyone wishes they had just stayed home and binge watched Netflix instead. So just to be clear, you are the mother of Mitchell, which is Ms. Adams' ex-boyfriend. Yes. And I have to ask you, do you believe these are your son's biological children? Yes, I do. Please explain to the court. The first week that they was born, uh, Kristen's mom called me. So she said, by that, look, take a look at the babies. Look at these pictures. Some ain't right. Drum roll, please. The DNA results are in. It has been determined by this court. The biological father is Mr. Spencer. It has been determined by this court. The biological father is Mr. Spencer. <laughs> So we kick things off with Mr. Buchanan, looking as confused as a chameleon in a bag of Skittles, voicing his skepticism about the paternity of Ms. Stimbridge's six-month-old cutie pie. He's on his third You Are the Father rodeo, with the previous two rounds proving he's not the daddy. The plot thickens as he hints at Misery Stimbridge's possible shenanigans, including a not-so-secret rendezvous with his ex-buddy slash roommate. And just when you thought it couldn't get any spicier, Mr. Buchanan discovers clues of Ms. Stimbridge's infidelity post-jailbreak. Among the evidence, lemon drops. Yep, you hear that right. Lemon drops, the candy of love, betrayal, and everything in between, with gossip that's juicier than a watermelon at a summer picnic. She claims to have caught Ms. Stimbridge in a rather, ahem, compromising tableau. This latest scoop adds more layers to Mr. Buchanan's suspicion pie, making it a five- and As the courtroom drama unfolds, Mr. Buchanan, in a moment of unexpected tenderness, shares his deep emotional bond with the little one in question. Paternity mystery be damned, he's ready to be the dad of the year, regardless of what the DNA bingo decides. Grab your tissues. This is where it gets heartwarming and slightly less ridiculous. Two. And now, for the moment we've all been waiting for, the DNA results are in. When it comes to six-month-old Sophia, Mr. Buchanan... You so, get this. Mr. Hardy is out here, full of conviction, dropping the bomb that he's the one and only daddy to 26-year-old Taylor. He's like, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, never once doubting he's the main man in her life. But then, plot twist. Taylor's stepmom throws in a wild card, hinting maybe, just maybe, another dude might be her real dad. Cue the dramatic music and a collective gasp. What you have always known, that you, father, the defendant's 26-year-old daughter, Taylor, you say your belief proven to be true after Taylor learned another man was not her biological dad here in this courtroom. Come to me and ask me if he was her dad because she said her stepmother told her that he was not. How old were you then? 12, 13. Just when you thought it couldn't get more like a daytime TV drama, Ms. Lynn steps up to the plate, swinging. She accuses Mr. Hardy of living in a soap opera, suggesting he's been puppeteered out of fatherhood by unseen forces. But wait, there's more. She casually drops that there might be another guy in the mix, making the paternity plot thicker than a thing Thanksgiving gravy. Mr. Hardy, undeterred, stands his ground, claiming father-daughter resemblance and perfect timing with Taylor's mom as his proof. It's getting spicy. You say Ms. Lynn is a master manipulator who has stopped you from being a daddy to your little girl. Ms. Lynn, you claim the plaintiff is not Taylor's biological father. There's a possibility between him and one other person. So, Mr. Hardy, you say you've always known you were Taylor's biological father? Randy and I was together at the time that Taylor was conceived. I was there much as we could possibly be together. Taylor, meanwhile, is having her own Who's My Daddy saga. Picture this, Thanksgiving, a time for turkey and apparently life-altering conversations. Taylor decides she's not just after Mr. Hardy's secret gravy recipe. She wants to know if he's her bio dad. Fast forward to a Facebook detective drama with Taylor and Mr. Hardy exchanging Are You My Father messages. Spoiler, he thinks yes. Taylor, I want to ask you, all this time you're being raised by Mr. Jennings, and this is the man you believe is your biological father your whole life. Yes, Your Honor. So when you meet Mr. Hardy, it really means nothing to you. 
Yes, Your Honor. So how did you find out that he might be your biological father? It was Thanksgiving. I think it was right, maybe I was 23, right around there. I had asked my mom because my boyfriend had mentioned that I looked like him. Ms. Lin, in a moment of rare calm, reflects on why she decided to play the paternity card later rather than sooner. She's like a parental ninja trying to shield Taylor from emotional shrapnel. It's all about timing, folks, even when that timing makes everyone's life a reality show episode. Ms. Lin, when you hear your daughter speak so beautifully about a day spent with Mr. Hardy, that just having that moment just meant the world to her. How does that make you feel? Because it is your assertion that there's a very real possibility that he is not her biological father. It hurts me for her because she grew up knowing the man I was married to as her father. Just as you're grabbing more popcorn, enter Mr. Bryant, the dark horse in this dad derby. He's been lurking in the shadows, thinking he might be Taylor's real dad. Talk about throwing a wrench into the works. Now we've got more potential daddies than a Maury Povich marathon. How did you find out about him, Mr. Bryant? Uh, the last time I appeared here. Yeah. In this courtroom? Yes. Then I asked her what his name was, and I looked him up on Facebook. Who do you believe is your biological father? Mr. Hardy. Yes. Because you don't believe Mr. Bryant. Yes, I don't think I look like him. You don't think you look like him. Miss mm. Lynn, you had informed Mr. Bryant that he was a possible father? Yes. So he knew this? Yes. Drum roll, please. As we reach the crescendo, the DNA test results. It has been determined by this court. Taylor's biological father is Mr. Bryant. Yes! Yes, I told you! Can I give her a hug? In a twist no one saw coming, not even M. Night Shyamalan, the courtroom drama of White View. White kicks off with Mrs. White's audacious move to save her crumbling marriage by proving Mr. White is indeed the superhero dad of their daughter, Savannah, amidst a backdrop of scandalous infidelity. Grab your popcorn because you ain't seen nothing yet. This is a case of White versus White. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Ms. White, you've opened your case because your last and only way to save your marriage and family is to prove to your husband that fathered your three-year-old daughter, Savannah. Yes, yeah, sure. You admit you've cheated in the past, but once the results are revealed, your husband will trust you again. Yes, Your Honor. As the plot thickens and the suspense builds, Mr. White, with the skepticism of a detective in a Neuer film, questions the real MVP status of his fatherhood to Savannah thanks to the spicy extramarital salsa his wife was dipping into. He's teetering on the edge of calling it a quits, pending the dramatic drum roll of the test results. Spoiler alert, the juiciness is just beginning. And as much as you love Savannah, you do not believe you're her biological father and are prepared to divorce your wife when the test proves your case. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. White, a divorce? Yes, ma'am. Explain. I, I just can't be with somebody that's going to constantly cheat on me and have me raise. The saga takes on more loops than a roller coaster at Six Flags, with the courtroom becoming the stage for the airing of the White's dirty laundry, featuring Mrs. White's infidelity that started shockingly a weak host marriage, and Mr. White turning into Sherlock Holmes, uncovering his wife's escapades through neighborly gossip and the deep, dark woods of social media. Media. Brace for impact. The revelations are about to get real. Doing the snooping on Facebook, seeing where his location was, looking through her phone, and then we got into an argument one night. He showed up, and that's when I knew there was something happening. You just don't have any trust in this relationship? No, because from a week after we got married, I'm catching her cheating constantly. A week after you got married? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. White, have you been cheating? Yes, but I have, like, abandonment issues. Digging deeper into this soap opera, Mrs. White spills the beans on her cheating escapades, citing a void of love and affection, possibly a side effect of watching too many rom-coms rooted in her abandonment issues from being adopted. The plot thickens, twists, and basically does a quadruple axle as we glide into the next chapter. Because you admittedly have been cheating, you've had to open this case to Correct. prove paternity of Savannah in hopes of saving your marriage. Yes, our anniversary is in two days, so I'm, I want to make this right so we can better our marriage. Raising the stakes to sky-high levels, the countdown to their anniversary puts the pressure on solving the paternity puzzle of Savannah. Mrs. White is on a mission to prove her husband's daddy credentials to save their roller coaster marriage. You're not ready for the twists and turns coming up. I moved in with them after a month of being together. I ended up getting pregnant with our first child and we ended up getting married and it just, everything just happened so quickly at 19 years old. So And so you got married, you got married young. Yes. In a plot twist that adds fuel to the fire, Mr. White drops the bomb with evidence of Mrs. White's continued adventures in infidelity land, featuring risque text messages and secret rendezvous plans with mystery men, shaking the very foundation of their offspring's paternity. The suspense is killing, and more bombshells are on the way. And he said the only way I can come back into the house is if I was to admit everything and just be honest. Take me to that day. I, I, I can't imagine happening. I was hurt, and I was pissed off. 
but in that same time, I, it was kind of a re relief because I knew for a fact that it was actually happening. It wasn't just, oh, it's an assumption. I don't know for a fact. Just when you thought your jaw couldn't drop any lower, the courtroom is hit with a tsunami of evidence against Mrs. White, including spicy photos flying around, deepening the canyon of trust issues in their marriage. But wait, there's more. Buckle up, folks. I'm afraid to look, Jerome. So this says, Happy Valentine's Day. How did you find out about this, Mr. White? When on Valentine's Day, when I found the text message, I took the entire phone that has all the pictures, all the text messages, all the calls, everything. This next photo is a picture we can't even show. A male body part. In a teary-eyed, no-sniffling confession, Mr. White pours his heart out about his undying love for his kiddos and the Herculean struggle to leave the chaotic embrace of his relationship, all while dodging Mrs. White's manipulation grenades aimed at keeping him in the game. The emotional roller coaster is just picking up speed. What are you feeling right now? I just love her. She has what she would call, uh, she aspirates. So when she drinks, she has to have it thickened or half of it will go into her lungs and she'll get pneumonia. Difficulties than my other children. I just love her. I can't, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have my kids. And I've, I've tried to leave this relationship. Throwing a curveball into the mix, the paternity of Mrs. White's bun in the oven comes into question amidst her confession of a February fling. Yet she stands firm on Mr. White being the father. Brace yourselves, the revelation will blow your minds. Caught herself up in a lie because she just told us that she didn't sleep with him, but she just admitted to cheating in February. <laughs> I don't understand why are you still holding on to the lies. We're here now. If you say you want to fix your family and you want to try to have your husband, your marriage, you gotta be honest. I have to ask you again. Did you sleep with the other man in February on Valentine's Day? Yes, Your Honor. In a climax filled with baited and bad breath, the courtroom's atmosphere is thick with anticipation as the paternity test results are revealed. It has been determined by this court. Mr. White, you are her father. As the screen flickers to life, we're catapulted headfirst into a saga of soap opera proportions. The curtain rises on the dramatic case of Casey vs. Ewing, Edwards, and Hawkins, unfurling a paternity dispute juicier than a ripe peach at a summer picnic. Ms. Casey's, who spent her life under the impression that her father was the man named on her birth certificate, now deceased, finds her world rocked by Mr. Edwards' bold claim that he, in fact, is her real dad. Just when you think you're about to get a handle on this emotional ride, it does a loop-the-loop. -loop. Ms. Casey, you say that for more than 25 Five years, your mother has told you that a deceased man who is listed on your birth certificate is your biological father. Yes, Your Honor. Now another man, Mr. Edwards, is claiming he is your biological father. Yes, Your Honor. The atmosphere is charged with the kind of suspense you'd expect before the final showdown in a reality TV show. As Ms. Case takes the stage, she lays bare the soul-crushing journey of growing up fatherless, the existential crisis of not knowing her real lineage, and how this mystery has been a thorn in her side, messing with her identity and upbringing. Her heartfelt confession is more gripping than the season finale cliffhanger of your favorite series. Actually, it been hell not knowing where I came from. I built a bond with Otis Hawkins, who's on my birth certificate, even though he's not ever been in my life. Life. I do not know what the man looks like. I don't have a picture of him. I don't have anything about him, but he is on my birth certificate. <laughs> My oldest daughter I gave, I passed Hawkins on to her. So I pretty much raised my kids the way that I have never been raised. I made sure that the mother and the father is in the home. Ms. Ewing throws in a plot twist worthy of an award. She narrates her valiant attempts to bridge her daughter with the family of Otis Hawkins, only to stumble upon the bombshell that he was supposedly pushing up daisies. This twist not only thickens the plot, but drenches it in a layer of mystery and melancholy, proving that when it comes to family drama, truth is stranger than fiction. And just when you think you're piecing the puzzle together, someone scatters the pieces. Um, I called his cousin to see did she want to spend time with Lakonda, and um, she informed me then that he had been shot in the head by his brother and he was deceased. Lakonda was seven years old when I was told that. I didn't want to tell her until she got older. I didn't know how to tell her and I'm telling you exactly what I was told. The air crackles with tension as Mr. Edwards steps up, wearing his heart not just on his sleeve, but practically on a billboard. With the passion of a Shakespearean hero, he declares his unwavering belief that he is Ms. Case's progenitor, citing eerie familial resemblances and a gut feeling that screams family. This declaration throws a wrench into the works, ensuring your guesses are as good as flipped. I don't even understand how I can tell. It's like the hair stands up on my back. She looks so much like my family. She's got everything that my mom had. I got six other daughters. And 
and, and my youngest daughter, I mean, if you look at her and look at her, you do. They look very similar, you Yes, say. yes, ma'am, they look. At some point, you hear from Mr. Edwards. Yes, you hear me. Judge Lake, with the timing of a seasoned drama queen, drops the bomb that Otis Hawkins, long thought to be an ex-member of the Land of the Living, is actually alive and kicking. This twist not only sends the courtroom into a frenzy, but turns the case and Ms. Case's understanding of her family tree on its head. The collective gasp of the courtroom is just a teaser for the roller coaster of revelations ahead. You've been told for over 25 years that Otis Hawkins, the man you believe to be your father, was dead. Yes, ma'am. But he's alive. <laughs> And we oh found God. him for you. Oh my God. Mr. Hawkins. God. Oh my God. Look how the district is. In a crescendo of anticipation, the truths we've been salivating for spill out like the juiciest of gossip. The DNA results are finally here. Pertaining to whether Mr. Hawkins is the father of Ms. Casey. Mr. Hawkins, you are not <laughs> her father. <laughs> in my heart, you steal my child. I know. Right out of the gate, Judge Lake bursts onto the scene, all business, introducing the high-stakes courtroom drama of Pace versus Fobbs and Randolph. There's Mr. Pace practically shaking in his boots, scared to bits about the thought of not being the bio dad to Little Prince. He throws the gauntlet down at Miss Fobbs, accusing her of the ultimate betrayal, hitting the hay with his BFF, the other dad contender. And just when your jaw hits the floor, buckle up, Aga. Miss Fobbs with a gulp, cops to her epic blunder of juggling the two gents, but crosses her fingers and toes, hoping Mr. Pace is the real daddy-o of her son. Mr. Randolph the partner in crime and second daddy possibility, sheepishly acknowledges his part in this soap opera. Brace yourself, the plot's about to thicken, practically congealing. Miss Fobbs spills the tea on her slip-up with Mr. Randolph, blaming it on feeling left in the cold by Mr. Pace's graveyard shifts. Yet, the soap opera is far from over. Once we found that out, being that she wanted her own space, we ended up moving into another spot together. So you were in a real relationship with Mr. Pace? Yes, Your Honor. When did this love triangle, this cheating, begin, and how? I wouldn't necessarily call it a love triangle. The situation with me and Randolph only happened once. Each moment is juicier than the last. The sordid affair surfaces during a spat, slapping Mr. Randolph with the potential daddy label. This revelation is marked by Mr. Pace's sense of betrayal and his surprisingly zen confrontation with Mr. Randolph. The suspense is building to a crescendo. Basically, what we were arguing about was past. It was just me feeling neglected. I do work a lot. I provoke clubs and parties, so I am out and I am around a lot of, I would say, women. And she kind of takes that as me being unfaithful. So were there trust issues? At times but not at the time that the situation occurred, no. The face-off unveils shocking truths. The clash between Mr. Pace and Mr. Randolph unfolds, with Mr. Randolph owning up to the boozy blunder. Hold tight, what's coming will have you clinging to the edge of your seat. We kind of all agreed, me and him agreed, that we definitely needed to find out what was going on as far as the DNA of... As the puzzle pieces start snapping into place, the suspense is torturous. The trio begins the baby face-off, scrutinizing Prince, Mr. Randolph, and Mr. Pace for any family resemblance. The upcoming twist is going to knock your socks off. Pretty much exactly alike. Little, little characteristics, forehead maybe, mouth. The air is electric with suspense. The climax approaches with the unveiling of the DNA test results. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Pace, you are not his father. <laughs> My bad, bro. Uh, so sorry. In an absolutely electrifying moment that had everyone on the edge of their seats, the saga of Beto versus Bolton kicks off with a bang, complete with the judge's dramatic entrance and a courtroom buzzing with anticipation. Ms. Beto, visibly agitated, lays into Mr. Bolton for demanding a DNA test for their little one, Ileana, arguing that his quest for genetic confirmation has thrown a wrench into their previously blissful domestic bliss. Mr. Bolton, on the other hand, is a picture of desperation and determination. Ms. Beto, you say you were furious when the defendant asked you for a DNA test on your seven-month-old daughter, Ileana. Now you claim that request has broken up your happy home. Mr. Bolton, you state you have reason to believe Ms. Beto's child may not be your biological daughter. You say you are desperate to discover the truth because you've already grown to love her as your own. Yes, as the courtroom falls into a suspenseful silence, Mr. Bolton dives into a heartfelt monologue about his last courtroom drama where the verdict shattered his dreams of fatherhood to another child. He recounts the 
whirlwind of emotions when Miss Bido announced her pregnancy, clinging to hope for a child of his own. But the plot thickens in the delivery room when a doctor, with the subtlety of a bull in a china shop, hints at doubts over the baby's paternity based on her complexion, igniting a wildfire of gossip and speculation about Ileana's looks. Dive deeper into this emotional quagmire with us, but brace yourself for the jaw-dropping turns ahead. Ah, nah. His father. Mr. Bolton, so what has happened since you were last here? Since last time I was in court, I was very devastated to find out the news about the young boy not being mine. But in the same sense, I was happy because Miss Beetle was pregnant with a child. Supposed to be mine. The plot thickens even more as the couple navigates through a minefield of skepticism from everyone around them, relatives, pals, and even nosy Parkers, over Ileana's paternity thanks to her fair skin and bright blue peepers. This relentless scrutiny puts their love on the line and fans the flames of Mr. Bolton's insecurities, despite Miss Beetle's best efforts to calm the storm with reminders of their diverse heritage. Hang tight, because the tale is about to twist into even more captivating knots. But that's what I'm saying. For the father, that can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming. You have to know your mate. And if you know that you have a loyal, faithful, loving woman, then anything anybody say so Mr. Should go Bolton, on one did the you other. know you had a loving, faithful, loyal woman? I did, but that's the relationship. If you look at the baby, the baby's, man, the baby's white. So, uh, the atmosphere was electric with suspense, as Ms. Beto confesses to a fleeting separation and a mysterious rendezvous with another gentleman during a tumultuous phase, throwing Mr. Bolton's paternity doubts into overdrive. The drama intensifies with Mr. Bolton's haunted past of paternity puzzles and Ms. Beto's passionate defense of her honor. Strap in for an emotional whirlwind that's about to get even wilder. I felt like I was pressured getting pushed to the point where I should see just to make you happy. Because this is what you're doing, you that put was pressure your on logic? Yes, that was that, I mean, that was my logic, because every day she She's saying, hey, you're a cheater, you're a cheater. So look, I cheated, I did, and I admit to that. She left. She wanted to go stay with her. He didn't admit to cheating. I saw the texts from the female, all right? And I confronted him like a woman should. Is, is I, I'm going to confront. With each word spoken, the courtroom's anticipation reached fever pitch as the estranged lovebirds bring out a visual aids bonanza, comparing Mr. Bolton's and Ileana's features in a dramatic photo showdown. The relentless cloud of uncertainty and emotional chaos pushes them to a temporary split amidst declarations of undying love and commitment to Ileana against all odds. Prepare your heartstrings for an epic tug of war in the episodes to come. If you felt like that, you should have been said that. You don't yeah, wait don't seven know. months later and then tell somebody like that. We're supposed to get married and everything. What you mean? Yeah, but When he told me that we were in the bed and the first thing he said to me is, oh, you know, I love you, right? And then after that, I don't even know how we got to it. All I know is he was like, oh, I don't think she's mine. I want a DNA test. And yeah, I lost it and I wanted him to get out. Yeah, you're right. I she did kick you out because I told him either I'm going to leave and go to my family, which is far from them. As emotions surged like a tsunami heart-wrenching testimonies from the distraught parents paint a vivid picture of their deep bonds with Ileana and the torment wrought by the paternity debacle. A tear-jerking video submission captures Mr. Bolton in tender moments with Ileana, underscoring his fervent wish to remain her dad. DNA be damned. The climax looms on the horizon, promising a twist you'd never see coming. Time she got pregnant, day in labor, hospital. I just really want to be a father to, to this child here. I've been there since day one. Still. I, I am. Just because, yeah, my past and, you know. And the last time you were in like court? like signs. The last time I was in court, I mean, you know, came out, not sure. But the signs are there, so many people saying it. I need to be sure. I understand about people's past. Everybody has a past. The courtroom was a cauldron of suspense as the verdict unveils. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Bolton, you are her father. Oh, uh, can you leave the case of Taylor and Johnson versus Barber kicks off with a scenario that sounds more like a plot twist from a daytime soap opera than a courtroom drama. The plaintiffs, Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson, claim they both magically got pregnant at the same time by the defendant, Mr. Barber, who seems to have been busier than a bee in spring. They argue that Mr. Barber has been more of a Houdini than a father, disappearing when it comes to supporting their children for even more astonishing revelations. Miss Taylor, you are suing Mr. Barber for $3,600. You are also asking the court to award you $3,880 in child care expenses. Yes, Your Honor. In a scene is straight out of a primitive drama, breathtaking moment, Mr. Barber drops a bombshell, admitting he's the father of all the children involved and has even autographed their birth certificates like their memorabilia. The discussion about his presence during the births and his emotional Oscars-worthy performance when confronted about his absence at one of the deliveries adds more layers to his already complex character study. The next scene is even more gripping as the judge brings a new perspective to the table. So, a revealing spotlight, the focus turns to Mr. Barber's financial
financial contributions, or the lack thereof, which makes the two packs of diapers he bought seem like a desperate attempt at a peace offering. Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson share their tales of minimal support, which could easily be the plot for a tragic comedy skit. But just when you think you've heard it all, the story deepens with even more intrigue. Have you? The courtroom is thrust into the realm of a telenovela when it's revealed Mr. Barber had three women pregnant at the same time, turning the courtroom into a scene straight out of a telenovela, complete with gasps from the audience and dramatic background music. The drama escalates to new heights, setting the stage for a verdict that will leave everyone talking. You know, so bring receipt. Yes. I bring receipts. And information for and the court regarding your claim. Yes. Is it for the uniform? School uniform. For school. Diapers. These expenses are all reasonable and legitimate. Seeing as though you have acknowledged this child, signed his birth certificate, you have a responsibility. The case of Adel versus Jones kicks off with the court clerk spicing up the courtroom, introducing a story juicier than a primetime soap opera. Mr. Adel, feeling more betrayed than when he finds out his favorite show was canceled, alleges Ms. Jones pulled a fast one on him by getting him to sign the birth certificate of her daughter, Jasala, amidst a backdrop of infidelity. Mr. Adel, you are here today to prove Ms. Jones committed paternity fraud. You claim Ms. Jones duped you into signing her daughter's birth certificate only to find out after her child was born that she cheated prior to getting pregnant. You say she broke the terms of your relationship. Is that correct? Mr. Adel, diving into the nitty gritty, reveals their swinging lifestyle, accusing Ms. Jones of stepping out of bounds by having a rendezvous without him as her wingman. He's convinced Ms. Jones is trying to make him the fall guy for her baby, sparking a debate over the do's and don'ts of their open relationship playbook, which apparently included a strict no solo flights policy and an iron clad commitment to protection. What do you mean she broke the terms of the relationship? We have certain rules. We're swingers, you know, and um, okay. And she went outside of the relationship. She cheated on me, and now she's trying to pin the baby on me. So wait, you have swinger rules? Yes, ma'am. What are the rules? What are the terms? The rules are you don't you don't go outside of the relationship and have have uh, sexual relations with anyone outside of the relationship unless the other one is present. Miss Jones owns up to her mischief, confessing to cheating as a comeback for Mr. Adel's suspected escapades. She maintains she armored up during her act of spite, which was set off by stumbling upon a photo of Mr. Adel that screamed guilty. This tit-for-tat move had her channeling her inner soap opera villain, seeking revenge with the finesse of a scorned telenovela star. He cheated too, though. I did out of spite. You did it out of spite. You yeah. feel like he cheated. Your Honor, she's, she swears to God I cheated, and I, 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 don't, I don't cheat. Oh, there is a picture in my bed with someone else. A picture of Mr. Adel in the bed with somebody else? Your bed? Yes, Your Honor. And that's why you cheated, because you saw that picture, so then you went out and did it. Absolutely. Now we know two wrongs never make a right. It just makes drama. The tale takes us back to how this dynamic duo first crossed paths and took a dive into the swingers' pool, with Mr. Adel playing the role of the seasoned guide. Despite Ms. Jones's initial reservations, akin to dipping her toes into ice-cold water, she plunged into the lifestyle, aiming to score brownie points with Mr. Adel, which led to their memorable, albeit awkward, first threesome. At first, I thought he was crazy. Why would you want to sleep with somebody else other than your loved one? Because That's it's what I'm thinking. It's exciting. But I gave it a chance because I loved him. So the first time you all have this threesome, what happened? I mean, I know what happens, I guess, but... <laughs> I, well, I really don't, but I, I don't know if I want to know. The plot thickens with the mystery of Jasala's paternity taking center stage amidst the backdrop of their unconventional relationship dynamics. Ms. Jones admits to a steamy encounter with another player during one of their swinging soirees, but stands her ground on the protection protocol, throwing a curveball into the paternity puzzle. What happened with this other man? Why decide to have sex with this other man? I felt neglected. He wasn't home. He would leave many hours of the night, sometimes even days. And when I would ask him where he was, he would tell me it's none of my business. Business. So I turned around and went out with one of his friends, had a couple drinks, and one thing led to the next. We used the condom, I remember, and when I told them there may not be a possibility, I was trying to get under his skin. In a twist worthy of a season finale cliffhanger, the courtroom holds its breath as the DNA results are unveiled. The air buzzes with a mix of shock, tears, and a sudden rush of reality, hitting harder than a poorly timed sitcom laugh track as everyone processes this life-altering news. If she is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the man I need to be. I'm gonna be there for her, and we're gonna, we're gonna start a, we're gonna start a life. When you say start a life, do you two want to have a relationship together? I, I, I loved her since the day I met her, you know, and I'd, I'd like to move on with her. 
I'd like to be, I'd like to still be in a relationship with her. And I, I can't bl blame her 100%, but I, I need to know if that's my baby or not. I'm glad you can admit that. I think it's time for the results. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Adel, you are the father. I told you. The episode starts with the kind of drama that could put daytime soap operas to shame, featuring the case of Banks versus Hawkins. Miss Banks is throwing shade faster than a cloudy day in Seattle, claiming Miss Hawkins is pinning her baby on Banks' late son, Daryl, like he's some kind of posthumous paternity pinata. On the flip side, Miss Hawkins is standing her ground, insisting Daryl is the daddy, and accusing Miss Banks of trying to erase her son's legacy as if she's got a giant cosmic eraser. Miss Banks, you say the defendant is pinning her baby on your son, Daryl, who was trapped tragically murdered before her child was born. You say Daryl told you he didn't believe he was the father, and you intend to prove that today. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Hawkins, you state Ms. Banks is denying her son's legacy, Jasani, and you claim today's DNA results will prove Daryl is the father. Is yes, that correct? Your Honor. Miss Banks dives into her sea of skepticism, not convinced that Dasani, who, by the way, shares a name with a brand of bottled water, adding an unexpected layer of hydration to the drama, is her grandson. She talks about her bond with Daryl, who apparently had more doubts than a conspiracy theorist at a science convention. She paints a picture of Daryl and Miss Hawkins' roller coaster romance, complete with other women popping up like whack-a-moles, claiming Daryl's the father of their kids, too. It's like a Maury Povich show, but with more plot twists. I don't believe that Jashani is my grandson, and I'm here to prove it today. For the simple fact that Jada and my son had a very rocky relationship. We were just were really close. We talked all the time. He would just call me to tell me that he loved me. They kept breaking up. So when my son told me about this, I told him that I was gonna get a DNA. And the type of person my son was, if he really believed that Miss Jada had his baby, he would have said to me, no, mom, no. Miss Hawkins steps up to the plate, swinging for the fences, with her love story with Daryl portraying a romance that could make Romeo and Juliet look like a casual fling. She's laying down the timeline of their relationship with the precision of a Swiss watch, trying to debunk Miss Banks' skepticism as if she's a mythbuster dealing with relationship rumors. This is her chance to prove that her connection with Daryl was more than just a fling. It was a marathon of love, not a sprint. Daryl and I had a strong relationship. We went, we went on and off. I loved him very much. He loved me very much. When I told him I was pregnant, he wanted me to keep it we were we got back together and we started working on it and so if you got pregnant during the time you broke up and you were seeing someone else could this other person potentially be your child's father no no your honor because i was only with someone else for two weeks i found that i was pregnant i was about six weeks pregnant so you feel like you were already pregnant before you and daryl broke, broke up, up yes Miss Banks tells the tale of how she found out about Miss Hawkins' bun in the oven, which apparently was more surprising than finding out your quiet neighbor is a karaoke champion. This bombshell led to a who's the daddy debate that could rival any primetime mystery show, turning the whole scenario into a game of Clue, where everyone's guessing who the father is with the enthusiasm of a detective on their third cup of coffee. He came to me, he called me on the phone, and he was like, Mom, Jada's pregnant. And I was like, who is Jada? And he was like, she's my new girlfriend. And I was like, oh, here we go again. My son had a lot of girlfriends. And to me, Jada was just another girl that came along, and now she's saying she's pregnant. Of course, Daryl was gonna be like, he wants to have a baby. He comes from a large family. So how was it that he expressed that he was doubtful? When she called and said that she was pregnant, she was living with another man. Oh. Correction. Oh. I was not living with another man. I was staying with my cousin. I was in a relationship with another man. And when I found that I was pregnant, the other man said, if you decide to keep the baby, let's end the relationship. That's how I ended back up with Daryl. So you came back to my son because another man didn't want you? Because I wanted my baby, and Daryl wanted my baby too. The courtroom heats up faster than a microwave meal, with Miss Banks and Miss Hawkins slinging accusations like they're in a food fight, mm, but with words. The air is so tense you could cut it with a knife or perhaps a gavel. This verbal tug of war pulls at the heartstrings and the laugh lines as the situation's absurdity unfolds like a dramatic origami. You're really the reason your son is dead. I'm not the reason he's listen, dead. Listen, listen, lady. You're the reason. Ladies, you know that. You ladies. know that. 
ladies, come on. Girl, do baby, it. tell do you it. something. If he Best wasn't with your trashy self, first of all, let's get some order. Let's there. get some order, ladies. Why would you name him Jay Shani when you know that my son is dead? The whole time you were pregnant, you told us you were gonna Let name that speak. baby Daryl Ray Daniel III. Let you speak. In a twist that's part heartfelt and part head scratching, Miss Banks extends an olive branch or maybe a whole olive tree, inviting Miss Hawkins and the kiddo to move closer. This gesture is more complex than a lasagna, showing Miss Banks' tangled web of hope, skepticism, and a dash of unexpected hospitality. It's like she's saying, I might doubt you, but let's be neighbors. Once he passes, do you try to form a relationship with Miss Hoff? Yes, I try to form a relationship with her because I knew Jay the situation. I have a bunch of kids. I have a house. So I talked to Jada on the phone and I said to her, well, Jada, come on. Move to Houston with us. I can help you better if you live close to me. I bought Jada a one-way ticket. Yes, it was a one-way ticket because you were supposed to be coming. I get to the airport with balloons in my head, excited because this is all that I have left. I'm standing in the airport like an idiot. This one's nowhere around. And then, the moment of truth. The DNA results come in, shining brighter than a spotlight on a stage. It has been determined by this court. The percentage of relatedness between Miss Lewinda Banks and Jasani Daniel is 99.99% you are related. <laughs> The case kicks off with Ms. Hayes dropping the bombshell that her sister might be the mother of her husband's child. After a decade of marriage, no less, she's all set for a paternity showdown, warning her sister of an impending soap opera-level drama if the kid turns out to be her husband's. Ms. Hayes, playing defense, is unfazed, ready to bet her last dollar on the paternity test and plotting a sister exit strategy post-reveal. You say that your sister, the defendant, claims to have a child with your husband of 10 years and you have petitioned the court for a paternity test and you are here to warn her that when he finds out her baby is not his today she'll probably never hear from him again now miss hayes you state that your sister is just jealous that you were able to have her husband's baby totally unexpected right miss hayes caught her hubby and sister in a mega awkward moment and it was like oops not this again because her sister's always been a bit too close to her exes the defendant just shrugged it off leading to a wild chat about their crazy family photo album stick around because the next Next bit is even juicier. How did your sister steal your husband? I came home and found him and her in our bed naked. I knew that they were sleeping together, but to put it in my face and be in my bed and me walk in and catch him naked, why would it be any different? She slept with my first husband and my second husband. You and I didn't even know about my second and she husband had me, until me around each of them in the and same you know, predicament. You won't believe this mess. We then hear about how the defendant's life was a roller coaster of oopsies, from addiction to being homeless, and how the plaintiff tried to be the superhero. They've got this weird love-hate thing going on, with betrayal, sisterly moments, and even the plaintiff helping deliver her niece or nephew. Just wait. It spirals even more out of control up next. I've had custody of this girl since she was 11. You know, the choices that she made between everything else. The latest time that I rescued you, I helped you get clean. Yes, Your Honor, I went she to did. Chicago after not hearing from her for seven years. I lost control of my life, myself, my morals, everything. When I got clean, got you every time you picked up a phone. When I call. got clean, I Who just I was you? I had been Who an addict and you? homeless for 15 dad. years. It wasn't your mom. And it I didn't know me. how to be it respectful. I didn't know how to be a woman. I didn't know how to be a lady. And when all this came about, I didn't go to my sister and say, I need sex or I feel lonely. We used to hang out in her room together, watch movies, whatever we would do. Just when you think it's all out in the open, things get even spicier with the defendant confessing to trying to woo her sister's man. Suppose supposedly because her sister told her to. This turns the courtroom into a full-blown circus, sparking a wild debate about respect, self-worth, and the kind of bonkers logic that seems to run in the family. The judge is more like a referee, trying to make sense of the sharing is caring marriage philosophy. You're gonna wanna see what's up next. It's a doozy. Get ready for the big drum roll as the paternity test steals the spotlight, naming Mr. Hill. We, we took a DNA sample. That, that, that is the truth. I for actually the, showed. The you also stated to the court, Ms. Hayes, that in all the years that you were together with Mr. Hill, he never got you pregnant. No, and the okay, other 25 right. women that he carried on with for long-term relationship. That's I am, what that is. I don't want your baby. I don't okay. want Kayla. I didn't say you wanted to have the baby. I said you wanted to have the baby taken from us. It's proven I, by your action. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Hill, you are her father. <laughs>